I really only came to see that still. <laughs> and I want to talk about stills, not moving images, because I don't look at films anymore. I haven't done for about three or four years now. Film's over. <laughs> you know, in my game, which is literary fiction, literary fiction's over too. But literary fiction survived for quite a long while because of film. Thanks, film. <laughs> literary fiction was the grease to film's Rome. They needed us. They gave us gigs in Hollywood. F. Scott would pitch up and get pissed and not write screenplays. Martin Amis once said, don't believe they've made a book of your film till you rent the video. I've had options that have gone all the way to the front page of Variety and not been made. But I don't resent film. And now it's dying. I feel sorry for film. <laughs> sorry, film. It died for me, actually, three years is an exaggeration. Film died for me when I was working on a long essay on the ISIS beheadings videos uh, about a year and a half ago. And what struck me about the whole ISIS beheadings videos was if you recall that awful period, I think it was in the autumn of 2014, when ISIS were threatening to behead hostages and then to upload the videos to the web. What people were really upset about was the videos. Yeah? They were really upset about the videos being on the World Wide Web. I'd argue they were rather less upset about the people having their heads chopped off. <coughs> now, you might say that that's the power of film, but I'd say that that's the power of something else. We can call it post-film, if we like. After film. There'll have to be a new word for it. Philip Hammond, at that time British Minister of Defence, said, in response to the videos, mind, not in response to the beheadings, in response to the videos, said that Britain was going to commit to a 20 billion investment in a naval base in Bahrain. You know? And a further 20-year commitment to uh, the region, military commitment to the region, because of the videos. And it occurred to me at that point, you can think of film imagery as having two components to it. Mimesis, film captures what we actually do, how we actually act. It shows. It shows. But it also tells. It tells us things. But the problem with the ISIS videos were that they neither were mimetic nor diegetic. They weren't mimetic because the way they were cut, you couldn't tell whether they were real or faked. You never actually saw anybody getting their head chopped off. And they failed in their... Well, they didn't fail in terms of being diegetic. They told you things. But what they told you was not what films used to tell you. There was an instability in their diegetic component because what they told you was that you, if you are a taxpayer in this country, would be paying a lot of money to build a naval base in a ghastly little Gulf state with a lousy human rights record. That's what they were telling you. And it occurred to me after working on this essay, I mean, I'd been, I'd, I hadn't been watching film for a number of years. I'd watched less and less and less. But it just hit the buffers after the ISIS beheadings videos. And I stopped watching any kind of full motion film, video, television at all. Because under such conditions of hyper-reality, every single moving image needs to be interrogated by the viewer on the basis of diegesis and mimesis. Is it showing you what it purports to be showing you? Is it telling you what it purports to be telling you? 
Anybody who now slumps uncritically in front of a screen, taking for granted the mimetic and diegetic components of what they're watching, is a dupe and a fool. But actually, you know, things have been getting quite bad for a while. There have been a number of studies, I'm sure you're all aware of them. There's one particularly good one called The Tyranny of Film, which talks about the concept of the tyranny of film, which, I'm, again, I'm sure you're all aware of. I'm sure you're all aware of the fact that the average shot length in movies has been decreasing steadily throughout the 20th century. I think it's now down to around three seconds. Somebody may be able to tell me. Also, think of editing techniques in films. Think of montage, think of fades of various sorts. They've mostly gone. Most of the editing techniques used in contemporary Hollywood movies are high-speed cross-cuts of one sort or another. A cross-cut, of course, compels attention to the screen. I'm sure all of you will have had the experience when watching flashy, bangy, whizzy contemporary Hollywood films in particular of a sense that your eyes are kind of pinioned to the screen in a way that you don't quite like. And if you don't allow them to be pinioned to the screen, there's a point at which you sort of can't even suspend disbelief in the imagery that's on the screen at all. It just becomes a kind of swirl of color and light. You can no longer read the image. This is particularly true of films that are not only edited with these very, very, very uh, short shots and lots of use of cross-cutting, but particularly where you have a lot of CGI as well. I'll talk a little bit about CGI, because I think that's part of the problem as well and why I don't watch films anymore. You're all quite quiet. <laughs> Perhaps you feel sorry for me because I can't look at films anymore. I don't really need to look at films anymore because reality is a film. Yeah? So who knows about the wagon wheel illusion? Yeah. So when you see a wagon wheel on a film, it often appears to be traveling backwards when the wagon is traveling forwards, yeah? Ever wonder why that is? You don't even need to look at it on a film. It actually is the same when you just look at it. Or sometimes if you're in a tropical place and lying on your bed and looking up at the rotating fan, it'll appear to be turning backwards. That's because you don't see in full motion. You see in single frames. You knew that. How many single frames does your brain process a second? 22, just like a film. Oliver Sacks, the, the magnificent neuroscientist who died last year, marvelous essay of his called In the River of Time that he published in The New Yorker a few years ago. And if you want to look into these ideas in detail, have a read of that. But he observes in the essay, perhaps that's why film has such a hold on us. It's because it's actually replicating in the manner of its exposition our own neurological capacity for absorbing imagery. In a way, you can think about our engagement with film as being a colossal interleaving of all of our perceptual systems with this technology. Yeah? And the evidence of this interleaving is in the ubiquity of the screen in contemporary culture. We are the people of film. It's almost as if we've attempted to create some kind of full motion replication of all of the myriads of stills that we're all processing all the time. Anybody know what that is? <laughs> From? Thank you, who said that? You can come to my birthday party. <laughs> it's just gonna be you and me. <laughs> I don't do social. I don't eat. There's not gonna be a film screening. We'll just look at a photograph of a cake for a while and then go home. 
Yeah, it's the, uh, thank you, I love you. It's the title sequence of Tarkovsky's Solaris, my favorite film. I don't have a favorite person, a favorite book, a favorite shoe, a favorite jock strap, a favorite politician, but I do have a favorite film. And the reason Tarkovsky's Solaris is my favorite film, I was a big science fiction fan when I was a kid, and Solaris came out the year after Kubrick's 2001, maybe a year or two later, and it was advertised in London as the Soviet 2001. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, I mean, it, it's nothing like Kubrick's 2001. One thing is, that the effects, such as they are, are completely low-tech. There's no real attempt to create the sense of being in outer space and orbiting an alien planet that you'd see in an, an American film. But see Solaris now, and it's fresh as paint. See Solaris now, and you will suspend disbelief in the idea that you're on a space station orbiting a planet many light years from now. See Solaris and marvel at the length of the shots. Oh, heaven. <laughs> shots, continuous shots that last for a minute, often locked off shots from a rostrum camera like this one, rostrum camera shooting down into a stream bed, just the tendrils of water weed waving and waving. Anyway. I saw that film on general release, age 12, right? Two and a half hour long Soviet philosophical science fiction, fiction epic. And by the end of it, I was so ensorcelled by this movie. <laughs> yeah, that word, ensorcelled. <laughs> That's what they pay me for, right? <laughs> <laughs> that by the end, I thought, actually, I just have to tell you an anecdote about that and about being a bit of a sesquipedalian. I remember years ago when Lynn Barber was still a fierce, fearsome interviewer. She interviewed me, and I thought, this is going to be... I was relatively young. I thought, this will be quite tough. What can I do to wrong-foot her? And I thought, well, I'll just drop a few really good words in. <laughs> and I said, uh, she said, do you, do you like to socialize? I said, no, not really. I don't enjoy all that tagisivation. <laughs> <laughs> and she wrote the interview up. She said, he really is the sort of man who uses words like tagisivation in conversation. <laughs> 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 By the end of the movie, I thought I could speak Russian. I couldn't remember even having looked at the subtitles for about the last hour and a half. It had gripped me that completely. I still love it to this day. But now, I can only look at the stills. So when, so, when, so when they ask me to come and speak, I'm serious about the ISIS beheading things. I'm serious about the ubiquity of screens. I'm serious about the way it's fracturing our ability to consider film as an artistic medium anymore. Korzbiski, the great Polish linguistic philosopher, talked about the idea of a map the same size as, as the territory. In fact, his famous phrase, the map is not the territory, is a way of understanding what we understand about the world. But what we're creating at the moment in the form of the World Wide Web and the Internet and the ubiquity of our personal computers, and in particular our screens, is a map the same size as the territory. People like uh, Kurt Ray Kurzweil, who prophesy the singularity in which we're all going to be uploaded into the cloud, it all seemed very dramatic, very science fiction, very Solaris. It's already happening. It's actually already happening, if you think about it. It's going on all the time. You are being uploaded. You are already existing in a rather diaphanous and cloudy way. The problem for the novel is that people are losing the capacity to engage with the structures and modes in which it's possible to engage with fiction. 
digital is not the same. The codex was the platform in which the novel developed. Okay? There's no reason for long-form fiction to exist in the form that it has once we read digitally. But I put it to you that there may be no real reason for narrative filmmaking or documentary filmmaking to exist in the form we're used to it existing once the screen is as ubiquitous as it is. And it is ubiquitous, even in the last year or two, thanks to London Transport installing Wi-Fi on the underground. You can now get onto an underground carriage and see little blue screens all along either side. People's ability in the street, they walk along like this with the missile open before their eyes, their faces wan in the uplight and ghostly. <laughs> you laugh. I'm glad you're laughing. I'm glad you find it amusing. <laughs> and I think it is amusing, but it, but it questions whether or not we can watch films in quite the same way as we did. Back to the tyranny of film. You know, neuroscientific research pro proves pretty conclusively through something we call the visualization hypothesis that we absorb less information from film than we do from any other form of narrative, whether you're listening to something on the radio or reading a book. And it, the, the real difficulty is for people to produce counterfactuals. So you can show people a sequence of film that is obviously a narrative sequence and they might expect an outcome and then you can chop it off. If it's a film, people will be less able to think of possible narrative outcomes than they will with an audio recording or with a written narrative. There's something non-productive -pro -pro and passive in a way uh, about our interaction of film. Add in the tyranny, the cross-cutting, the short shot sequences, and you have a very kind of unthinking uh, medium already. And I'd argue the loss of our engagement with cinema as audiences, a sense of being a collective audience, it was important watching that film Solaris back in the very early 70s in a cinema. It was important being there. It was important the ceremonial of it. I think our loss of that, that uh, aspect of cinema going and the loss of the unitary quality that was provided to us when screens were far less ubiquitous. You had to go somewhere to watch a film. You had to engage with a film. You couldn't start and stop watching a film. Just as our perceptual mechanisms seem, you know, kind of rigged to interleave with films 22 frames per second, so these many, many screens seem to be sliding in between the objects in our field. It's the, it's the internet of things. You know, if I kind of pick apart these two parquet wooden blocks, I'll probably, oh yes, I can see a little blue shine down there. <laughs> Yeah, it, it must, somebody must have put in a parquet cam earlier on. <laughs> I think there might be a screen down there. When, um, when the first Victrolas were produced and they made wax cylinder recordings of Shelley Arpin singing the Volga Boat song and they played it and obviously it sounded like... <laughs> people thought he was in the room and started searching behind the drapes for him. <laughs> Every new method of reproducing our sensory experience has seemed at the time to be the most incredible level of verisimilitude for the people who witness it. But you may note that we've now gone over plus in that respect, okay? You'll all have watched films with absolutely brilliant CGI recently that have been sort of boring. Yeah, it's kind of boring. I'll go and see Doctor Strange. 
Look at Manhattan folding in on itself like that. Well, what was that one a few years ago? What was it? Inception, yeah. That started the kind of cities going like this thing, yeah? <laughs> I remember thinking, I think I reviewed Inception. I said, you know, Julie Birchall once said rather brilliantly that Stephen Fry was a stupid person's idea of what an intelligent person is like. <laughs> uh, I borrowed the line for Inception. I said, it's a stupid person's idea of what an intelligent film is like. But I think it was Inception that I finally reached the overplus of CGI. You know, when you can actually reproduce in visual terms, <laughs> when you can actually reproduce in visual for terms almost anything it's possible for the individual to imagine, you've gone into an overplus in the medium. High-definition televisions are now sold that have higher definition than your eye. <laughs> How does that work? You know that thing when you're watching high-def TV and the image goes <laughs> like that? And for a moment, it's as if you're seeing the very machine code of reality itself. Yeah? You are. <laughs> That's what you're seeing. It's pretty disturbing, isn't it? Badiou, the French philosopher, believed that au fond, at the very root of our understanding, are just zeros and ones, rather like the credit sequence of the matrix. So that problem, we've got a problem now. Our ability to produce suspension of disbelief is, in fact, greater than our suspension of disbelief. Our capacity to produce images of high fidelity is greater than our capacity to see them. So I don't know where you're going to go with any of that. <laughs> Basically, I'm miserable. I've been writing literary fiction for years. Mariella's here. She knows me. I think my books have been getting better. Yeah, I like Thank you. They sell less and less. They sell Jack. <laughs> right? You guys are filmmakers. Join me. <laughs> Thank you. Mm. Mm.